Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you once again for joining in to this uh, wonderful session on colon cancers of the Jaipur Surgical School. Uh, is Dr. Govil uh, hearing me out? Dr. Govil? Dr. Govil, am I audible? We can't hear you if you're around. Yeah, Hello. Welcome, Dr. Govil. Me now? welcome, welcome. We can now see you. We can okay. now see you and we are all eagerly waiting to hear you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm also actually, I thought I was audible earlier also. I is know there's okay? some technical issue, I, I guess. I think everybody is now eagerly waiting to hear you. Could you please okay. start with your presentation? Thank okay. you so much. I'll just share my screen. Yes. Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay. So I'll start. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's a good opportunity for me to interact with all of you. And today we'll be talking about the management of colon cancer. And uh, I'll be just discussing this topic under the various headings regarding the basics of uh, the colon cancer, the risk factors, clinical fat features, the diagnosis and investigations. There are some differences if there's a right-sided or a left-sided malignancy, the management complications and follow and conclusions. Coming to the <coughs> colon, I think the first thing is anatomy. This is almost a 1.5 meter uh, is the length of the colon and the colon basically consists of uh, these parts, the ascending part of the colon, the transverse part of the colon and the descending part and then this is the sigmoid colon and then the rectum and the anal canal. And as you can see the length of the various uh, parts is a little different. The longest is uh, the transverse colon which is 50 centimeters approximately and then is the sigmoid uh, colon which is also around the same thing. And as we all know, I think these are the two areas, the ascending colon and the descending colon. These are the areas which, has, which are relatively fixed and are in retroperitoneal position, whereas the transverse colon and the sigmoid colon are the one which are mobile, have a mesentery. And as you can see, the transverse colon has a broad mesocolon, whereas the sigmoid mesocolon sometimes has a very narrow mesentery and therefore, you can sometimes have a volvulus of the sigmoid colon rather than the other parts of the colon. So these are the main areas. And as you can see, this is one of the widest area of the colon, the cecum. Whereas the sigmoid and this junction, this is almost the narrowest part of the colon, uh, which is uh, more likely to get obstructed. So all these are various features of these. And as you can see, these are the uh, fixed part of the colon, the descending and the ascending colon. And laterally, the fascia of the uh, peritoneum covering is uh, on the line of the toll where it is connected. Uh, I think the basics start from embryology. As you all also know, everything is related to embryology. And the part of the colon, this is the foregut, midgut and the hindgut. And the blood supply and a lot of things depend on the embryology. So the upper part is responsible for the stomach and duodenum, middle part for jejunum and ileum, and the last part, hindgut, comes from here. And in this, the colon uh, is from the hindgut. And these all rotate and these have significances while we are uh, performing surgeries that you dissect in avascular planes. So there is a importance of these. Uh, uh, parts of the colon and the embryology of the development of these structures. As you can see, the blood supply also blood supply also varies uh, from the for the foregut we have the celiac axis, for the midgut we have the superior mesenteric artery, and for the hindgut we have the inferior mesenteric artery. And the part of the colon which is up to the mid part of the transverse colon that is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. Therefore, the right-sided colon is mainly uh, supplied by the, uh, the superior mesenteric artery, whereas the left side and the rectum and the sigmoid are supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. So these are the basic uh, things which I think you should be knowing that this is the uh, right side of the colon, which is supplied by the right colic, the middle colic, and then the left colic and the sigmoid branches these come from the inferior mesenteric artery. And these also communicate amongst each other, the superior mesenteric artery and the left 
uh, and uh, in way mesenteric artery through the uh, mesenteric arcade and there are collaterals like arc of reolot which will connect these two vessels in case that is why when we ligate inferior mesenteric artery you get blood supply from the other part because of these collaterals and the uh, arc of reolot Again, the same thing highlighted here. This is the superior mesenteric artery coming from the aorta, which is the inferior mesenteric. And these are the collaterals, arc of Rowland and the marginal arteries, which connect these two vessels. Now, the nodal uh, drainage of the colon varies. And this is uh, close to the colon. These are the pericolic uh, nodes, which you can see like uh, from the uh, red colored nodes, these are the pericolic nodes which are close to the colon. And then there are intermediate nodes which are bluish here. And then central lymph nodes regarding the, uh, which are near the origin of the vessels which are supplying these structures. They are the yellow nodes. And the white ones are the distal periotic lymph nodes which are the most uh, distal nodes part where the spread of lymph nodes occur. Again, coming to the malignancy, it varies from uh, area to area. And as you can see, the common site of the malignancy is the sigmoid and the rectum. The left side is the commonest site. Almost 60%, you can see, 20% sigmoid and 38% rectum. So I'm not covering the rectal malignancy during this talk mainly, but the main stay of the uh, site of the cancer is the rectosigmoid where it's almost 50 to 60 percent and the rest is divided equally 10 percent in the descending and the ascending colon and six percent in transverse colon and the flexures basically. Uh, coming to the pathology like these are the types where you can see the uh, annular growths, the tubular growths, the ulcerated growths and the uh, cauliflower-like growths. So, and the kind of uh, growths also differ during uh, whether the growth is in the right side of the colon or the left side. As we can see, these are the types like the ulcerative and the polypoid cauliflower growth. These are more common on the right side of the colon. Whereas these, the annular and these uh, tubular, these are more common on the left side. Therefore, these present with an obstructive symptom because if you, you have to always learn how you can correlate the pathology with the clinical symptoms of the patient. So as uh, the left side, these are more common. So left side, uh, dead growths in the descending colon or the sigmoid colon, they will present more with obstructive features. Whereas these usually, since the right side is also wide and the ulcers are not annular or obstructive, so majority of these will not present with obstruction, but yes, they can present with a bleed or other symptoms related to these lesions. <clears throat> this is a uh, ulcerative growth on the right side of the colon. As you can see the mucosa, this is fairly normal mucosa, but these are the uh, kind of ulcerative growths where inverted margins, which are very characteristic on the right side of the colon. So there, there are various risk factors. As you can see, uh, does uh, the uh, incidence of color, colonic carcinoma varies from country to country, and it's much higher in the West and uh, in the uh, other countries, African countries also, where the various factors which are also responsible for these malignancies, apart from the genetic factors which are responsible for the hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes, Positive family history is found in almost one-fourth of these patients. 25 to 30% may have a positive history. So that's important uh, to know. If a person in a family has a carcinoma of the colon, the chances that another person will develop are fairly high. And therefore, they should be in close surveillance uh, to uh, identify the growths early. Then there are certain factors which are also associated with uh, higher uh, chances, inflammatory bowel disease, like if the patient has uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, then the chances that they will develop a colonic cancer are higher. Like in ulcerative colitis, 
if the duration of the ulcerative colitis is long, like if uh, the, it is uh, two years, the chances of malignancy are almost 2% to 5%. And if it is 20 years, the chances increase to almost 15 to 18%. So with the duration of the ulcerative colitis, the chances of malignancy increase. Then amongst these risk factors, there are various factors which we can modify, like smoking. It is important. Smoking increases the risk of colonic cancer and even other cancers also. Then uh, processed meat, that red meat is one of the major culprits which is responsible for development of uh, the malignancies. In fact, I can tell you that in India, the incidence is relatively lower as compared to the Western countries. Probably more vegetarianism is one of the factors, more high fiber diet is a factor probably. But now the incidence in India is also increasing as uh, our diet and other factors are Western. We are adapting more towards westernized diets and other things. And another important factor is physical activity. If the patient is as a very sedentary person, obese person, Usually you would say that uh, if the patient is obese, uh, chances of malignancy are less. But uh, in colonic cancer, it is <clears throat> important that if you're dealing with a patient who, has, uh, uh, who is obese and who has sedentary habits, who is not working uh, physically much, then the chances of these uh, problems, these colonic cancers are higher. Then there are various dietary factors and all these obesity and other factors which are uh, alcohol intake, meat intake, red meat, smoking, low intake of fibers, vegetables and fruits, all these are related to higher incidence of colonic cancer. And therefore, these are the factors which we should be careful and we should advise and increase awareness amongst the patient so that these things can be avoided because these things can be modified. And in case we have symptoms, then we should get the investigations done early because these are the cancers which can be treated almost completely, I would say, if they are detected in an early phase. There's nothing 100%, nothing like 100% in medicine, but almost more close to 100%, you can treat these patients. And we have patients, we've been operated uh, 25 years back or 20 years back, and they are leading an absolutely normal life. So these are the cancers where you should be more careful. If you catch them early, you can treat them properly. Therefore, the screening tests are important. Colon cancer screening tests are important. And especially, these are more important in areas where the incidence is high, where the prevalence of the cancer is high. And there are various very simple tests like uh, fecal occult blood testing, which is which does not cost anything. It's a very simple test. If it is positive, then you can further evaluate the patient. So there are guidelines in the West where you get these tests done every six months, and especially more so if you have a family history or if you're, if you're more prone uh, to develop a cancer. There are other uh, forms also, uh, fecal immunochemical tests also, sensitivity of these tests varies, barium anema, nowadays is not used usually. Sigmoidoscopy flexible is an important tool of investigation. An ideal thing is a colonoscopy. So if a patient comes with abnormal symptoms, abdominal uh, symptoms or bleeding per rectum, I think colonoscopy, we should have a very low threshold and we should go ahead and get the colonoscopy done if uh, there is any evidence of any abdominal symptoms and even if there is a patient who cannot get a colonoscopy done due to some reasons, there are even CT uh, where uh, from which we have very advanced CTs where we can get a good virtual colonoscopy done. Although obviously a proper colonoscopy is always preferable. Now the clinical presentation. I think uh, I'll just uh, divide it into the right-sided colon and the left-sided colon. The as I told you, left-sided colon, the symptoms are more, the lesions are more like annular and tubular. Therefore, the chances of obstructive symptoms are more. So the obstruction is more common with the left-sided colon. Bleeding, obviously, is a feature which can be there. And 
alteration in bowel habit like before obstruction when there is partial obstruction patient can have alteration in bowel habits so if a patient comes suddenly that there is an alteration he had loose motions and then he comes suddenly with constipation and then again he keeps altering in bowel habits which are not improving with conservative management and it is persisting because acute infective processes usually settle down within 2 weeks or 4 weeks but if the symptoms are persisting over a period of 3 months or so then you should always get an investigation done and colonoscopy you should have a very low low threshold if the patient is a high risk patient or even otherwise if there is an alteration in bowel habits for a longer duration right sided colon which are more ulcerative lesions or polypoidal lesions usually present with a chronic blood clots often you would find a patient who suddenly collapse uh, while working and then you find that the hemoglobin is done and that is uh, uh, 5 gram percent or 6 gram percent uh, this is a frequent uh, sort of presentation in these patients because these patients get investigated by the cardiologist by the physician with everything and then suddenly some uh, uh, body asks for a colonoscopy and you find a Uh, lesion on the right side of the colon so they can present with anemia chronic blood loss melina and sometimes even just a mass in the right atrium fossa which may be completely asymptomatic so all these are features of the right colon in fact that is one of the reasons that right colonic lesions usually are detected late and they usually present with more advanced maybe uh, advanced stage and metastatic stage as compared to the left colon because they get obstructed early so they present in an earlier phase so the prognosis if they are detected early and treated early is relatively better with these left sided lesions as compared to the right sided lesions as i have already told you certain basic anatomical differences between the right and the left gut this is originated from the mid gut hind gut sma part of it sma ima and the right sided uh, blood supply is, has a lot of variations like the right uh, colic vessel which is uh, there is often absent in patients almost uh, 20 30% or maybe more than that and as i told you this has a larger diameter and this has a smaller diameter the presentation we've already discussed these are the points uh, in presentation then again as i have told you lower tnm stage we detect these patients early higher tnm stage when they present they can have a sertile serrated adenomas mucinous lesions adenocarcinomas whereas these are again tubular or villous adenocarcinomas these are typical ones and this usually are more advanced while they present and have a worse prognosis as compared to the left sided which usually present a little earlier and have a relatively better prognosis out of the two so to just summarize right sided majority may present with pain mass rectal bleeding off and on and anemia is one of the major presentation whereas the left sided again bleeding is one of the factors change in bowel habits is one of the factors bleeding and change in habit weight loss and general basic symptoms and obstructive features are much more common with the left side i think i'm just stressing these factors because they are important when you clinically see a patient then you can at least have a guess that probably we are dealing with a colonic malignancy and that too probably from the left side or the right side on the basis of the symptoms and findings of the patients so and how to investigate these patients investigations basically start with a basic investigation ultrasound is one of the basic investigation although bowel lesions are not very well visualized on the ultrasound but ultrasound can tell us that if there is any advanced disease sometimes the bowel lesions also can be seen on the ultrasound in the form of a target lesion and if there are any advanced uh, malignancy like liver lesions or ascites Uh, then these things can be identified on the ultrasound amongst the blood investigations cea that is carcinoma embryonic antigen that is one of the important 
investigations uh, which will help us in identifying these patients. CEA is a glycoprotein and the normal levels are below 3 nanogram per ml and it is mainly used. It may not be raised in all the patients and it is not very specific usually. It can rise in other situations also, but usually it is more important in follow-up of the patients. Like if the patient has higher carcinoma, higher CEA levels while we are operating and once we've removed the tumor, the CA levels should fall usually and that tells us whether we've cleared everything or not. And then post-operatively while following up, if the level increases, that also tells us that probably we uh, have we are having some recurrence or some other uh, area where the disease is active and we need to investigate that further. Then obviously colonoscopy is the mainstay of treatment for a colonic cancer and it should be done in all patients and it's a very important investigation. Like if the areas where the incidence of these cancers are high, there are standard guidelines that over the age of 50 uh, annually, everybody should be getting a colonoscopy done. In fact, in the West, they've decreased the age to even 40 years. And in our country where the incidence is not as high, we usually recommend that screening may be beneficial for patients uh, who have a family history of cancer, who are relatively high risk patients, who have ulcerative colitis, and these are the patients we should have a surveillance colonoscopy. But overall, even in hemorrhoids, I would suggest if the patient comes with a bleeding per rectum, we find that almost 50% of these patients sometimes are probably bleeding from a lesion rather than an, uh, a hemorrhoid. So all these hemorrhoids, before you operate for hemorrhoids, always try to get a colonoscopy done to rule out if there's any other associated lesions. And uh, sometimes if you're operated for a, operating a colonic cancer during emergency for obstruction or bleeding, mm -hmm. then obviously there is no time for a colonoscopy done, uh, for doing a colonoscopy during the emergency. And But in follow-up, you should always do a colonoscopy because quite often the incidence as I've written synchronous lesion, uh, if you have an obstructive lesion, there is a possibility that the patient may be harboring another lesion in the rest of the colon, which we may, might have missed at the time of surgery or evaluation at that time. So always get a full colonoscopy done within six months of surgery if the patient has been operated for emergency. So after colonoscopy, the other investigations which are important in these patients is a CT scan of the abdomen, pelvis and chest, which is used for the local staging and the overall staging of the patient to see if we have any metastatic disease and CT of the abdomen to see the local extent of the lesion. And PET CT has also come. It is, although it is not included in the guidelines of NCCN, but it is an important investigation and it is being done quite frequently, even if it prescribed sometimes to identify the site of the lesion and if there are any associated lesions elsewhere also. <clears throat> Rising CEA, obviously, as I told you, if there's a sudden rise of the CEA at any time, that obviously indicates that probably we are dealing with a metastatic disease or uh, any, therefore it needs further evaluation by a CT or a PET CT. These are colonoscopic views. You can see these are the lesions, polypoid lesion, polypoid lesion here. So these are the lesions. These are how, this is how a colonoscopy looks. These are the normal mucosa areas. And you can see this large polypoid lesion. And these are usually common on the right side, whereas the left side are more ulcerative lesions, which are more obstructive and uh, tubular lesions, which are obstructive. Again, this is a colonoscopic lesion. Then virtual colonoscopy, like in patients where we cannot do a colonoscopy for some reason, uh, from, uh, the patient is not willing at all, then virtual colonoscopy also is uh, helpful, although it may not be as specific as a colonoscopy, and you cannot take a biopsy with this, obviously. So uh, it is not the preferred one, but in case patient is not at all willing for a colonoscopy, we can consider 
virtual colonoscopy with the help of a CT scan, advanced CT scan, which are available today. And you can reconstruct the, uh, those images and do a virtual colonoscopy. And this is a CT scan and you can see the growth with partial obstruction there. Now coming to stages of the disease, the stages of the disease as with other malignancies are in the T and M uh, uh, pattern. T is the local extent of the depth of the lesion, N is the nodal status, and M is the metastatic status. And obviously the local extent depends on the various layers of the wall of the colon, the mucosa, whether it is involved or not, the submucosa or the muscularis, whether it is involved, or if the lesion is going outside, on those, it depends what stage we are dealing with. And then the number of lymph nodes, the lymph nodes, whether they are enlarged lymph nodes are present or the number of lymph nodes which are enlarged or affected also is indicative of the stage of the disease, whether we're dealing with N1, N2 or N3 disease. And M1 obviously means if there is any metastasis to the liver or lungs or any other area which is uh, beyond this field. So these are the various stages, stage one, two, three, four, where these lesions are identified. And the treatment also varies for these uh, lesions. In the early lesions, obviously in a colonic lesion, the basic uh, and the primary treatment is a surgical treatment. That is the uh, ideal treatment for this. And chemotherapy, if at all is required, uh, is required in the post-operative period, which is the adjuvant therapy. Now, as I think I just want to highlight here that in the rectal cancer, which is a little different from the colonic cancer, today there are a lot of uh, guidelines which are available where a lot of pre-operative treatment is done. But in the colonic cancer, uh, usually surgery is the preferred treatment and it can be followed by the adjuvant therapy. Adjuvant therapy is the one which is a chemotherapy or radiation therapy given after the surgical treatment. And if a neoadjuvant for a rectal cancer, a neoadjuvant treatment is required. But in the colon cancer, whether it is any part of the colon, the usually surgery is the mainstay of treatment and it is followed by adjuvant treatment if the disease is fairly advanced. And usually a part of the upper rectum which is considered along with the colon, because rectosigmoid, which is the mobile part of the rectum or uh, which is the peritonealized part of the rectum, that is uh, indicated and that can be treated as we are treating the colonic cancer. But for the mid and lower rectum, especially the, since we, it is not a peritonealized part, we have other uh, preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy followed by surgery. But in colonic cancer, surgery first is the dictum and always i think uh, that for any malignancy it is mandatory today uh, for a colonic cancer also and it is much more important for a rectal cancer to have a multidisciplinary meeting with our medical oncologists radiation oncologists and uh, other pathologists and radiologists to see the local extent and gradually there are a lot of advances which are coming in the um, treatment of these uh, conditions. So it is very important that all the cases, wherever the malignancy is, should be discussed and then uh, for a proper plan of treatment decided for these uh, cancers. Now coming to the surgery for these colonic cancers, I think the basic principles, these are the two basic things which have to be adhered to adequate margins and adequate lymph node clearance. I think these are the two areas which we should be very careful while we are operating for a colonic cancer. And as we've already told that mainly these are the colonic, these are the vessels, uh, pericolic lymph nodes which are uh, around the marginal vessels, intermediate lymph nodes and these are the central lymph nodes which are. So usually we would prefer to clear all these nodes if we have to uh, remove a lesion here. So all these nodes and the base of the uh, mesentery till the origin of these vessels should be cleared to get a better clearance of the lymph nodes and other uh, drainage areas.
Now coming to the various sites of the tumor, how do we decide what needs to be done? Like it varies on the site where the cancer is present. Like if it is in the cecum, we usually take this part of the vessel. And this is mainly decided depending on the vessels which are supplying this area. So these are the ileocolic and the right colic vessels which need to be included in your resection. So the, all the areas supplied by these vessels need to be covered while you're removing this. So this is a right hemicolectomy. If there's a cecal lesion or a lesion in the ascending colon or even the hepatic flexure, in the hepatic flexure, you may go a little more further. Like if it is a little hepatic flexure or a little beyond that onto the transverse colon, you do an extended right hemicolectomy where you take two thirds of the transverse colon and one third is left near. If it is a transverse colon, you take adequate margins, almost 10 centimeters on either side, and then do an anastomosis. That is good enough. If it is a splenic flexure, then these things are very variable. Um, you can take 10 centimeter margins also, but some people prefer that this is the mobile part, and this may be a better anastomosis. If you do an ileocolic anastomosis here, then some people prefer to do an extended uh, right hemicolectomy even up to this level. Flexure, left hemicolectomy, again a sigmoid colectomy. So uh, depending on the site and the blood supply, the resection area is identified. And you have to resect the tumor and the base of the, uh, the mesentery of that tumor, mesocolon, in that area. Again, the same thing highlighted depending on the site, you decide what needs to be removed and how long uh, mesocolon or mesentery needs to be removed. The basic, I think, uh, tips for anastomosis after removing of these lesions is that there should be no tension because if you're removing in a segment and joining two segments, uh, the lie of the uh, segment should be good and there should be no tension in the anastomosis. If you have to mobilize a little more of the colon, it is fine. But uh, when the anastomosis lies in the abdomen, it should be totally without tension. In fact, you may have to mobilize 10 centimeters more if you have uh, some tension in the anastomosis. Because if there is any tension, the chances of leakage are much higher. Again, the mesentery, I mean, rotation of mesentery is very important and you should uh, repeatedly check this before you do the anastomosis because if you join the thing once then uh, the chances of obstruction and complications are much higher and obviously vascularity is important uh, as compared to the small bowel the large bowel anastomosis vascularity is a little less and therefore you should be very careful the edges of the uh, colon where your anastomosis is are fully vascularized which you can see by your naked eyes. And nowadays there are a lot of tools also coming. You can see the pulsations in the mesentery. You can see the there are ICG diet which is being used to see the pulsations also sometimes. That's uh, usually not required, but uh, clinically if you see a pink uh, colonic mucosa and pulsation of the vessels, you can probably consider that as vascular and do an anastomosis. And another important thing which I think for a colonic uh, surgery, it is very important that need for defunctioning. I think you should always have a very low threshold for doing a defunctioning ileostomy in these patients or a defunctioning colostomy proximal to your anastomosis. Because if you are have any doubt in your anastomosis vascularity or if there are a lot of adhesions, you're not able to mobilize one uh, much or if uh, the patient has been obstructed and the bowel is not very healthy, the patient is on immunosuppressants. All these things, if they are there, then always think of a defunctioning ileostomy or a colostomy proximal to your anastomosis rather than going ahead with a uh, direct anastomosis and leaving it alone. Again, laparoscopic and minimal axis surgery has uh, its own advantages, but I think it should be done by the experts who, can, who have been doing these things advanced procedures for a long time and the literature has supported uh, these things. Obviously, there are advantages for the patient that there is less pain, less ileus, 
less complications if you do these laparoscopically or even robotically there have been studies which have shown advantage of the surgery but the basic principles i think uh, especially on the right sided uh, thing we should always be careful about the duodenum or the ureters even on the left side while mobilizing the spleen splenic flexure the splenic injury or the ureters i think and if you are doing a uh, repeat surgery like if the patient has been operated earlier there is a recurrent cancer or if there is a very advanced cancer always think of a uh, uh, rg uh, retrograde ureteric catheterization before you go in for surgery so that at surgery you are able to identify the ureters better certain newer concepts uh, are coming in colonic surgery which i don't think i'll go into much detail there is a like for a rectal cancer we do a total uh, mesocolic excision eme similarly for a colonic uh, excision uh, the complete mesocolic excision is the term which is coming central vascular ligation is the term which is coming and here lies the role of embryology and the planes which are avascular planes and meticulous planes where you can uh, do these surgeries uh, these uh, cme is complete mesocolic excision this is similar to t3 like in japan they do a very meticulous lymph node dissection and this is almost equivalent to a d3 resection central vascular ligation is all the vessels supplying the area where the tumor is they should be always ligated at the origin and include all the lymph nodes and the mesocolon till there again as i told you stoma i think we should have a low threshold temporary stoma we can do in these patients and <clears throat> can be easily managed uh, today with modern appliances and we should not be very hesitant to perform a stoma if it is required adjuvant therapy i think patients which usually come to us are fairly advanced majority of the times we deal with stage 2 stage 3 cases and adjuvant therapy is the therapy which is given after the surgery 4 to 6 weeks after the surgery and folfox regime 5f you look over and etc are given and these are the indications where once you remove the specimen and get a histopathology done if your lymph node retrieval is much less if the lesion is t4 going beyond the muscle if it is a poorly differentiated or if there is any perforation or obstruction along with the lesions so these are the lesions where you should consider an adjuvant treatment the five year survival rate as i told you if you detect these cancers early is fairly high more than 90% and uh, if these are treated early these are almost cured of the disease also stage 2 75 and these are the percentages and in colonic cancer another important thing is if there is an isolated hepatic or pulmonary metastasis which is amenable to resection we tend to be a little more aggressive because if with surgery if we are able to remove these lesions the results are fairly good and the five year survival rate is almost 20% if we are able to even with liver metastasis or pulmonary metastasis and uh, these are solitary lesions and they can be resected so if the uh, recurrences occur usually majority of these recurrences will occur within 2 years of the time of resection therefore follow up strategy is very important and we should always be very careful about the follow up of these patients and uh, very clear follow up like every 3 months especially ca if the patient has a raised ca we can only just get a ca done and a clinical examination and a very, very intensive follow up at least for initial 2 years where we uh, colonoscopy at a year also is important and we should get imaging done if there is any doubt at any stage we should get a proper imaging and a colonoscopy done and the complications of the surgical procedures can be very variable bleeding ureteric injury injury to the duodenum or pancreas or the spleen post operatively we can have an asthmatic leak pulmonary abscess pelvic abscess pulmonary com complications dvt uti stoma related complications and late we can have these strictures and recurrence of the tumor or obstructions and so all these complications we have to be careful while we are following up these patients so i think we i'll conclude here by saying that uh, we should try to identify these patients early 
have a very low threshold for colonoscopy. Aggressive surgical treatment is the key, but there is a definite role for adjuvant treatment, adjuvant chemotherapy, and a judicious follow-up and an aggressive approach if there is any localized reference should be done for these patients with colonic cancer. Thank you very much. I think I can... Thank Stop you, Dr. Govil. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Govil, for a yeah. very comprehensive uh, presentation of the entire uh, cohort and the entire uh, colon cancer armamentarium that is that is now available to us. Thank you. I think uh, I would want to extend a big thank you to the JSS team for having such kind of comprehensive talks where. And overall, uh, guidance can be provided to all those delegates and all those students who are here to uh, devote their time and listen to these lectures. I think Dr. Govil has given a very, very comprehensive lecture on colon cancer. He has discussed the academic part of the colon cancer, uh, right from uh, uh, the knowledge of the colon cancer, the biology of the colon cancer, as well as the detection methods. And he has also then discussed about the technical parts where we as surgeons come into play and all the surgeons in making as to how to plan a preoperative management, what to consider for surgery, whether it's open, minimal, invasive or robotic, uh, what all structures to be taken care of during the surgery, what all injuries to be prevented, what is the nomenclature of the resection techniques, the right, the extended, the left, the segmentals. Uh, I understand that he has not dwelled upon the rectum cancers, which is a totally different topic altogether. Uh, he has also discussed the newer concept and techniques over the CME, that is a complete mesopolic excision, the central vascular ligation. Uh, I think these are all the things that will be asked to even postgraduates as well as the people who are graduating for, uh, you know, for their surgeries and masters of surgeries. Apart from that, uh, I think uh, I would only request the students to read up a little more of lit literature about the recent advances. It is beyond the scope of such surgical lectures to provide you with very uh, recent surgical advantages. We can we can advances. Sorry, we can give you the names of all those things. Say, for example, you can have something like an HNPCC. You can have something like an FAP. Uh, you can have a short note in your uh, uh, exams for something like an adeno adenoma carcinoma sequence. You can have something like a short note on microsatellite instabilities as well as, uh, 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 you know, matrix metalloproteinases as well as DMMR uh, genes, mutation studies in colon cancer. So these are all the things which you will get into as a part of the recent advances as well as uh, through your uh, questions put up to your professors at your end. Uh, but I must thank Dr. Govil for a very, very comprehensive uh, uh, talk on colon cancers. And as I put in the message, uh, if we have any questions uh, for from the delegates, from the uh, students who are attending this, I would be happy and Dr. Govil will be happy to uh, give all the answers to those questions. Sure. You can raise up your hands or you can put a query on the, uh, on the chat box and then we will definitely be able to answer those. I think everyone is much more educative uh, because of your talks. There, there is uh, a question from uh, Naveen Fodyal, uh, and uh, uh, just give me a minute. Let me read it out. Have you, have, do you have the question in front of you? Yeah, yeah, I, read, I can read it. New well, adjuvant. Yeah, new adjuvant has no role in CA colon. Yeah, I think there are studies which are coming today uh, that in some cases where there are uh, as a locally advanced lesion. The advantage is mainly in T4B or in stages where there are a lot of adjacent viscera which you have to remove if you have to do a surgery. Then in those cases, you may consider a neoadjuvant treatment. Otherwise, routinely, it's not an indication. And there are uh, recent trials which are coming, but still, I don't think it is an established thing at the moment, but probably maybe in uh, times to come, it may turn out to be a mode of treatment for these colonic cancers. Anything yes, and what uh, rightly said by Dr. Govil is that the primary modality of treatment for colon cancers is surgery. Option 1 surgery, option 2 surgery, option 3 surgery. In case if you are left with no option of surgery, only then probably as surgeons we need to uh, take a discussion on a case-to-case -case basis whether there will be a real benefit. There have been recent advances in literature where people have been doing a lot of 
uh, VEGF and BRAF mutations to categorize the difference between the right colon cancers as well as the left colon cancers and to select a particular type of neoadjuvant treatment, uh, you know, which will which may benefit. Uh, but yes, as what uh, Dr. Govil has again quite uh, rightly pointed out, there are trials which are going on. And today the dictum is that we would obviously go for surgery first in all colon cancers and then get on to adjuvant treatments rather than a new adjuvant. New adjuvant as a concept has evolved more and more into the rectum cancers. And I think the JSS team will have one talk on the rectum cancers as well shortly uh, to follow it up with the colon cancers. With that, I would thank Dr. Govil for uh, sticking to time. Uh, I think uh, we would now call off this session if there are any more, not, not any more questions. And thank you once again, JSS team and Dr. Govil for being a part of this and enlightening us with the entire gamut of the colon cancers. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.